What new sports do all day? What do Smurfs do all day? Sm Papa Smurf says, Get out of bed. It's time to get up, you sleepy head. Smurfs brush their teeth. They wash their faces. They scrub their necks and other places. Then they march to breakfast on fast feet and eat and eat and eat. Then, of course, Smurfs clean up. They wash their they wash the dishes and mop the floors, and then it's time to go outdoors. Every day Smurfs like to play. They they like to hide behind a bush. They swing on swings and pull and push. Smurfs love to pull. They pull pull pull. They dive into pools. They splash about. They swim and float and then climb out. Smurfs go to school, they read and write, read they write, some spell quite well, some, some not quite. Then after school, they sing, they toot, they clap their hands, then howl and hoot. They love to play, and, and when they're through, they, they work, they, ha they all have jobs to do. They stitch and sew, they bake a cake, they write a poem, they hoe and rake. They lift and lug to build it, they build and fix, they scrape and paint, they stir and mix. What else do they do? They snooze, they sneeze, they ju and play some, and some play jokes and they like two T's. They laugh a lot, most days they're glad. Sometimes they cry, sometimes they're sad. Smurfs yell and shout, sometimes they mumble. Then when they get mad, they grouch and grumble. Some ride, some chase, some like to race. So Smurfs like to finish in first place. They throw and catch, they hit the ball. They ski, they skate, sometimes, sometimes they fall. They run, they jump, Smurfs love to tumble. They pass and kick, sometimes they fumble. They follow the leader, they race about until the, at last they're all tired out. And then their busy day is, and when they, and when their busy day is through, they hop in bed like me and you. The end. Hi, my name is Annie Fort, and I'm going to read to you "Tops and Bottoms" by Janet Stevens. Once upon a time, there lived a very lazy bear who had lots of money and lots of land. His father had been a hard worker and a smart business bear, and he had given all of his wealth to his son. But all bear wanted to do was sleep. Not far down the road lived a hare. Although hare was clever, he sometimes got into trouble. He had once owned land, too, but now he had nothing. He had, lo he had lost a risky bet with a tortoise and had sold off all, sold all of his land to bear to pay off the debt. Hare and his family were in a very bad shape. The children are so hungry, Father Hare. We must think of something, Mrs. Hare cried one, one day. So Hare and Mrs. Hare put up their heads together and cooked up a plan. The next day, Hare hopped down the road to see to Bear's house, but Bear of course, was asleep. Hello, Bear, wake up! It's your neighbor, Hare, and I have an idea. Bear opened one eye and grunted. We can be business partners, Hare said. All we need is this field right here in front of your house. I'll do the hard work of planting and harvesting, and we can split the profit right down the middle. Yes, sir, Bear. We're in this together. I'll work and you sleep. Huh? said Bear. 
So what will it be, Bear? Asked Hair. The top half or the bottom half? It's up to you, tops or bottoms. Uh, let's see, Bear said with a yawn. I'll take the tall puff. Hair, right, tops. Hair smiled. It's a done deal, Bear. So Bear went back to sleep, and Hair and his family went to work. Hair planted, Mrs. Hair watered, and everyone weeded. Bear slept as the crops grew. When it was time for the harvest, Hair called out, Wake up, Bear! You get the tops and I get the bottoms! Hair and his family dug up the carrots, the radishes, and the beets. Hare plucked off all the tops, tossed them into a pile for Bear, and put the bottoms aside for himself. Bear stared at his pile. But Hare, all the best parts are in your half. You chose tops, Bear, Hare said again. And now this season, I want the bottoms. Hare agreed. It's a done deal, Bear. So Bear went back to sleep, and Hare and his family went to work. They planted, watered, and weeded. Bear slept as the crops grew. When it was time for the harvest, Hare called out, Wake up, Bear! You get the tops! Get the bottoms, and I get the tops! Hare and his family gathered up the lettuce, the broccoli, and the celery. Hare pu pulled off the bottom for Bear and put the tops in his own pile. Bear looked at his pound and scowled. Hare, you have cheated me again. But Bear, said Hare, you are in the bottoms this time. Bear growled. You plant this field good. Hare, you've tricked me twice and you owe me one season of both tops and bottoms. You're right, poor old Bear, sighed Hare. It's only fair that you get both tops and bottoms this time. It's a done deal, Bear. So Bear went back to sleep, and Hare and his family went to work. They planted, watered, and weeded, then watered and weeded some more. Bear slept as the crops grew. When it was time for the harvest, Hare called out, Wake up, Bear! This, this time you could eat the tops and the bottoms. There, in front of Bear's house, lay a high field of corn. Hare and his family yanked up every corn stalk. Hare tugged off the road and put them in a pile for Bear. Then he carefully collected the ears of corn in the middle for her and put in the middle and placed them in a pile in a, his own pile. Bear rubbed his eyes and watched. See Bear, you get the tops and I get the bottoms. I get you get the tops and the bottoms. I get the middles. Yes sir Bear, it's a done deal. Now Bear was wide awake. That's it here, he hauled. From now on I'll plant my own crops and take the tops, bottoms and middles. Hare and his family scooped up all the corn and hopped down the road towards home. Bear never slept through a season of planting and harvesting. Hare bought back his land with the profit from the crops. And he and Mrs. Hare opened a vegetable stand. And although Hare and Bear learned to live happily as neighbors, they never became business partners again. The end. Hi, my name is Ben Houston, and I'm reading The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. Once there was a tree, and she loved the little boy, and every day the boy would come, and he would gather her leaves and make them into crowns and play king of the forest. He would climb up her trunk and swing from her branches and eat apples. And they would play hide-and-go-seek, and when he was tired, he would sleep in her shade. And the boy loved the tree very much, and the tree was happy. But time went by, and the boy grew older, and the tree was often alone. Then one day the boy came to the tree, and the tree said, Come, boy. Come and climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and eat apples and play in my shade and be happy. I am too big to climb and play, said the boy. I want to buy things and have fun. I want some money. Can you give me some money? I'm sorry, said the tree, but I have no money. I have only leaves and apples. Take my apples, boy, and sell them. 
in the city. Then you will have money and you will be happy. And so the boy climbed up the tree and gathered her apples and carried them away. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time and the tree was sad. And then one day the boy came back and the tree shook with joy and she said, come boy, climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and be happy. I am too busy to climb trees, said the boy. I want a house to keep me warm, he said. I want a wife and I want children, and so I need a house. Can you give me a house? I have no house, said the tree. But you may cut off my branches and build a house. Then you will be happy. And so the boy cut off her branches and carried them away to build his house. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time, and when he came back, the tree was so happy she could hardly speak. Come, boy, she whispered, come and play. I am too old and sad to play, said the boy. I want a boat that will take me far away from here. Can you give me a boat? Cut down my trunk and make a boat, said the tree. Then you can sail away and be happy. And so the boy cut down her trunk and made a boat and sailed away. And the tree was happy, but not really. And after a long time, the boy came back again. I am sorry, boy, said the tree, but I have nothing left to give you. My apples are gone. My teeth are too weak for apples, said the boy. My branches are gone, said the tree. You cannot swing on them. I am too old to swing on branches, said the boy. My trunk is gone, said the tree. You cannot climb. I'm too tired to climb, said the boy. I'm sorry, sighed the tree. I wish that I could give you something, but I have nothing left. I am just an old stump. I am sorry. I don't need very much now, said the boy. Just a quiet place to sit and rest. I am very tired. Well, said the tree, straightening up herself as much as she could. Well, an old stump is good for sitting and resting. Come, boy, sit down sit down and rest and the boy did and the tree was happy the end I'm Daryl Smith, and I will be reading Leo the Late Bloomer. Leo couldn't do anything right. He couldn't read. He couldn't write. He couldn't draw. And he was a sloppy eater. And he never said a word. What's the matter with Leo? asked Leo's father. Nothing, said Leo's mother. Leo is just a late bloomer. Better late than never, thought Leo's father. Every day, Leo's father watched him for signs of blooming. And every night, Leo's father watched him for signs of blooming. Are you sure Leo's a late bloomer? Asked Leo's father. Patience, said Leo's mother. A watched bloomer doesn't bloom. So Leo's father watched television instead of Leo. The snows came. Leo's father wasn't watching. But Leo still wasn't blooming. The trees budded. Leo's father wasn't watching. But still, Leo wasn't blooming. Then one day, in his own good time, Leo bloomed. He could read. He could write. He could draw. He ate neatly. He also spoke. And it wasn't just a word. It was a whole sentence. And that sentence was, I made it. I'm Donna Hanley Lynch, and this is my dog Batman, and we like to read. We've got a book today that's a, of a Caribbean story called Ratapata Scatafata about a little boy who likes to dream. June June liked to daydream, he liked to night dream, and he liked to dream in between 
when the birds sang and the lizards came out to bask in the morning sun. But June June dreams were often, inter often interrupted because there was always work to do. Well, one morning early, his mother called to him and he said, June June, wake up. Don't you hear the fisherman blowing his conch shell? Because you need to run across town and get us a nice pot fish for dinner. Well, Mommy, I was busy listening to the bird, said June June, yawning, and I wish the fish would just run across town to come to our house instead. Well, fish don't have legs, child. Well, what if I close my eyes and said a magic word like rata pata scata fata three times? Silly June June, come now. June June's mother couldn't stand around and listen to nonsense talk. She had clothes to wash. June June sat in the yard and squeezed his eyes shut, and he whispered and wished for a fish to swim across town. And he said, rata pata scata fata, slowly once, then twice, and then a third time. Rata pata scata fata, rata pata scata fata. And then he waited for his fish to come. Down at the beach, the last fisherman had hauled in his traps, pulled his boat onto shore, and he was late for the morning market, so he took a shortcut, shortcut past Jun Jun's house. Rushing along, he didn't even notice a fish wiggle waggle right out of the fisherman's basket. Floomp! When Jun Jun opened his eyes, what did he see on the dusty road? A fish! And what did he say? My wish has come true. Jun Jun's mother was happy with a nice wiggly fish, but Jun Jun, she said, why is the fish so dusty? Did you drop it? No, Mommy. The fish got dusty when it swam across town to our house. What an imagination. Time to fetch the goat now while I clean the fish and don't forget your hat. The sun is so very hot. Well, Jun Jun skipped off down the road to look for the goat. He looked for her in the field where the elephant grass grew. He looked down and he saw an alligator lizard slithering through the grass and he looked up and he saw a chicken hawk circling overhead. He looked straight ahead and he saw a mongoose sitting on its hind legs, still watchful and careful, but he didn't see the goat. I can't find the goat, Jun Jun said to the mongoose. I wish the goat would find me. What if I close my eyes, say a magic word like rata pata scata fata three times? So Jun Jun sat down in the grass and closed his eyes and he wished hard for the goat to come to find him. He whispered, rata pata scata fata, rata pata scata fata, and once more, rata pata scata fata, and he waited for his wish to come true. All of a sudden, that goat had been keeping her eye on him and she saw his little straw hat. She liked that tender straw hat much better than the tough elephant grass. And as soon as June June sat down, the goat crept up to him, closer and closer. Nibble, nibble, munch. When June June opened his eyes, who did he see with a mouthful of his straw hat but the goat? My wish came true. His mother met him on the way home. There you are, she said, and you found the goat. No, Mommy, the goat found me. Oh, I see. Same thing, huh, June June? Well, come along. It's lunchtime and, and lunch is ready. Well, when the heat of the day had passed, the old tamarind tree cast a shade across the yard and June June liked to hop around in the late afternoon sun and watch his own shadow grow longer like the tree. Don't go running after your shadow, June June, his mother said. Well, I have something else to show you. So she pointed up at the tree and she said, look, see, the tamarind's fruits are ready. See those birds pecking at the fruit? That means they're ripe and ready to pick. But mommy, the sugar birds aren't eating the tamarinds like the other birds. Maybe the fruit is too sour. Sour it is, June June, but the thrushes like it, so you better pick some tamarinds before the greedy thrushes eat them all. The tree was tall, and June June knew he'd have to climb way up high to pick his tamarinds. I wish the tamarinds would pick themselves, said June June. Sure enough, sure they won't, said his mother. But what if I close my eyes and make a wish and say, 
rata pata scat fata three times. But Jun Jun's mother couldn't stand around and listen to his nonsense talk. She had dinner to prepare. Jun Jun closed his eyes. He wished hard for the tamarinds to pick themselves, and he whispered, rata pata scat fata rata pata scat fata and finally rata pata scat fata well then the wind blew with a whoosh across the island and it knocked over the empty rain barrel it tore the sheets off the line and then it even shook the trees it shook the tamarind tree so hard the tamarinds broke loose from the branches and fell to the ground then the big wind blew away just like it had gone into the island it went back to see where it come from when Jun Jun opened his eyes, what did he see in his basket? Tamarinds. And what did he say? My wish came true. He carried the basket full of tamarinds into the house, and he said to his mommy, Look, Mom, what I have. And I didn't even have to climb the tree. Sure enough, the tamarinds picked themselves, I'm sure. Are you making up stories again? No, she said, hand me the sugar, and let's make some jam. Well, they pinned the thin brown shells off the tamarinds and boiled the sticky fruit and sugar water, and Jun Jun did all the tasting to make sure they weren't too sour or too sweet. Before the sun went down, they sealed up the last jar of jam. Jun Jun, his mother said, just one more job for you today. It's dry, dry, dry. Not a drop of rain for days. And the rain barrel's empty. Go and fetch some water from the well. I'm tired, Mommy. I wish the water would fetch itself. That's a sight we'll never see, said his mother. She sat down in the big rocking chair on the porch and she lifted Jun Jun in her lap. And I'm tired too, she said. We've had a busy day. But now if, you'd, if it had only rained, we wouldn't have to fetch that water. We wish it would rain. Mommy, why don't you close your eyes and say ratapata scatapata three times. Then your wish will come true. Jun Jun's mother laughed and she leaned back and she closed her eyes and she said, Ratapata scatafata. She sang softly, Ratapata scatafata, Ratapata scatafata. And what do you think happened? It rained. The drops of rain fell on the tin roof and into the empty rain barrel, lightly typing out the rain's own song, Ratapata scatafata, Ratapata scatafata, Ratapata scatafata, all night long. Hi, my name is Donna McElfresh, and I'd like to read this story to you today called Love You Forever, written by Robert Munch. I think it's a story that both adults and children will really enjoy. A mother held her new baby and very slowly rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she held him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The baby grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was two years old and he ran all around the house. He pulled all the books off the shelves. He pulled all the food out of the refrigerator and he took his mother's watch and flushed it down the toilet. Sometimes his mother would say, this kid is driving me crazy. But at nighttime, when the two-year-old was quiet, she opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, looked up over the side of his bed, and if he was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll love you always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The little boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was nine years old and he never wanted to come in for dinner. He never wanted to take a bath and when grandma visited, he always said bad words. Sometimes his mother wanted to sell him to the zoo. But at night time, when he was asleep, the mother crawled quietly across the floor and looked up over the side of his bed and if he was really asleep, she picked up that nine-year-old boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll love you always, 
as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He had strange new friends when he was a teenager, and he wore strange clothes, and he listened to strange music, and sometimes the mother felt like she was in a zoo. But at nighttime, when that teenager was asleep, the mother opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of his bed. And if he was really asleep, she picked up that great big boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Teenager grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a grown-up man. He left home and got a house across town. But sometimes on dark nights, the mother got into her car and drove across town. If all the lights in her son's house were out, she opened the bedroom window, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of his bed. If that great big man was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that mother, she got older. She got older and older and older. And one day she called up her son and said, you'd better come see me because I'm very old and sick. So her son came to see her. And when he came in the door, she tried to sing the song. And she sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. But she couldn't finish because she was too old and sick. The son went to his mother. He picked her up and rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he sang this song. I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my mommy you'll be. And when the son came home that night, he stood for a long time at the top of the stairs. Then he went into the room where his very new baby daughter was sleeping. He picked her up in his arms and very slowly rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while he rocked her, he sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, and as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Hi, I'm Emma Fort, and I'm going to read you a book called Counting on Frank by Rod Clement and Spian. Counting on Frank. My dad says, you have a ring. Use it. So I do. I sit down and fill my notebook with facts. Did you know that the average ballpoint pen draws a line 7,000 feet long before the ink runs out? My parents consider this fact to be a bit childish, but I'm sure the pen company would like to know. My dog Frank is pretty big and takes up a lot of space. I calculate that 24 Franks could fit into my bedroom, but sometimes there isn't even room for one. If Frank were a humpback whale, however, only 10 would fit into our entire house. I asked Dad about this, and he said that they would get in the way of the television. I calculate that only one dad would fit inside our big television, but only one-tenth of him would fit into Mom's portable television. Mom said she would prefer the top part because Dad's feet smell. We've got a tree in our yard. It grows about six feet every year. If I had grown at the same speed, I'd now be almost 50 feet tall. I wouldn't really mind except that I'd never get 
close to fit. I don't mind taking a bath. It gives me time to think. For example, I calculate it would take 11 hours and 45 minutes to fill the entire bathroom with water. That's with both fa faucets running. It would take slightly less time to empty as long as no one opened the door. When I get dressed, I don't think about fashion or style. I think about facts. For instance, instance, it's a fact that if I put on every piece of clothing in my closet, it I would be nine feet tall and six feet wide. I enjoy dinner not because of the delicious chops mom cook every night or the conversation. It's the peas. If I had accidentally knocked 15 peas off my plate every night for the last eight years, they would now be level with the tabletop. Maybe then mom would understand that her son does not like peas. There's a mosquito in my bedroom that's keeping me awake. It's very interesting in the workings of my brain. If it were four million times bigger, it wouldn't fit inside my ear, but I guess it wouldn't make more noise than a jumbo jet. At breakfast, I have a glass of orange juice and two pieces of toast. Our old toaster shoots the toast about three feet into the air. It makes you think. If our toaster were as big as the house, it could endanger low-flying aircraft. Going shopping with mom is a big event. She is lucky to have such an intelligent helper. It takes 47 cans of dog food to fill one shopping bag, but only one Frank to knock over 110. Because of Frank, my knuckles will scrape along the ground by the time I'm 25. The local club had a competition. You had to guess how many jelly beans were in the jar, and the prize was a trip to Hawaii. They didn't know who they were dealing with. There are 745 jelly beans in the average candy jar. I thought everybody knew that. As Dad said on the plane to Hawaii, you have a brain, use it. The end. Today I Feel Silly and Other Moods That Make My Day by Jamie Lee Curtis. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. Jilda McClure. Today I Feel Silly and Other Moods That Make My Day by Jamie Lee Curtis and illustrated by Laura Cornell. Today I feel silly. Mom says it's the heat. I put rouge on the cat and gloves on my feet. I ate noodles for breakfast and pancakes at night. I dressed like a star and was quite a sight. Today my mood's bad. I feel grumpy and mean. I picked up my room. It still isn't clean. I forgot to feed Franny and water the fern, and the cocoa I'm making is starting to burn. Today I am angry. You'd better stay clear. My face is all pinched and red, ear to ear. My friends had a play date. They left me out. My feelings are hurt. I want to shout. Today I am joyful. My mood is first rate. My friend's sleeping over. She says she can't wait. My freckles are popping. The sun is so bright. I ran in the relay with all of my might. Today I'm confused. My life's getting hairy. Sam says he's my boyfriend, but he also likes Mary. My mom told my father he might be a dad. I might get a brother. I'm not sure, I'm glad.
Today I am quiet. My mom understands. She gave me two ice creams, and then we held hands. We went to the movies and then had a bite. I cried just a little and then felt all right. Today I'm excited, there's so much to do. I'm going to sell cookies and lemonade too. I'm starting a club to go clean up the park. And I've got a big crush on my teacher named Mark. Today I am cranky, so nothing seems right. I have diarrhea and broke my new kite. Mom dyed her hair orange. My dad shaved his beard. My tooth came in crooked. This family is weird. Today I am lonely. I feel so small. My auntie's away. I wish that she'd call. My mom's working late and my dad has the flu. And although I've got stuff, I've got nothing to do. Today I am happy, I'm walking on air. I learned how to knit and to French braid my hair. I did my first solo in hip hop and jazz. This day's been so great, I am full of pizzazz. Today I'm discouraged and frustrated, see? I tried rollerblading and fell on my knee. I really want straight hair, but mine's curly Q. Should I cut it or grow it, or what should I do? Today I am sad. My mood's heavy and gray. There's a frown on my face, and it's been there all day. My best friend and I had a really big fight. She said that I tattled, and I know that she's right. Today my mood's great. It's the absolute best. I rode a two-wheeler and passed my math test. I played soccer at recess and we won the game. I sang in the show and my parents both came. I'd rather feel silly, excited, or glad than cranky or grumpy, discouraged or sad. But moods are just something that happen each day. Whatever I'm feeling inside is okay. How do you feel today? The end. Hi, my name's Hannah, and I'm going to be reading The Relatives Came. It was in the summer of the year when the relatives came. They came up from Virginia. They left when their grapes were nearly purple enough to pick, but not quite. They had an old station wagon that smelled like a real car, and in it they put an ice chest full of soda pop, and some boxes of crackers and some bologna sandwiches. And up they came from Virginia. They left at four in the morning when it was still dark, before even the birds were awake. They drove all day long and into the night, and while they traveled along, they looked at the strange houses and different mountains, and they thought about their almost purple grapes back home. They thought about Virginia, but they thought about us, too, waiting for them. So they drank up all their pop and ate up all their crackers and traveled up all those miles until finally they pulled into our yard. Then it was hugging time. Talk about hugging. Those relatives just passed us all around their car, pulling us against their wrinkled Virginia clothes, crying sometimes. They hugged us for hours. Then it was into the house, and so much laughing and shining faces and hugging in the doorways. You'd have to go through at least four different hugs to get from the kitchen to the front room. Those relatives. And finally, after a big supper, two or three times around until we all got a turn at the table, there was quiet talk, and we were in twos and threes through the house. The relatives weren't particular about beds, which was good, since there weren't any extras. So a few squeezed in with us, and the rest slept on the floor, some with their arms thrown over the closest person, or some with an arm across one person and a leg across another. It was different going to sleep with all that new breathing in the house. 
The relatives stayed for weeks and weeks. They helped us tend the garden, and they fixed any broken things they could find. They ate up all our strawberries and melons, then promised we could eat up all their grapes and peaches when we came to Virginia. But none of us thought about Virginia much. We were so bu busy hugging and eating and breathing together. Finally, after a long time, the relatives loaded up their ice chest and headed back to Virginia at four in the morning. We stood there in our pajamas and waved them off in the dark. We watched the relatives disappear down the road. Then we crawled back into our beds that felt too big and too quiet. We fell asleep. And the relatives drove on all day long and into the night. And while they traveled along, they looked at the strange houses in different mountains, and they thought about their dark purple grapes waiting at home in Virginia. But they thought about us, too, missing them, and they missed us. And when they were finally home in Virginia, they crawled into their silent, soft beds and dreamed about the next summer. The end. Hello, my name is Hetty Wagner, and today I'm going to read a book called Miss Fanny's Hat, written by Jan Karen. Miss Fanny has lots of hats, and each one is her favorite. When she wears her red felt with a big feather, she looks in the mirror and says, I just love this hat, and her friends at church say, Miss Fanny, we just love that hat. When she wears her green velour with the fancy pin, she says, I sure do love this hat. And her Sunday school teacher says, Miss Fanny, I sure do love that hat. Miss Fanny is 99 years old and very small. In fact, she's grown to be about the same size she was as a little girl. Miss Fanny and her daughter, Miss Wanda, live together. Miss Wanda makes breakfast every morning. Don't make me much breakfast, <clears throat> says Miss Fanny, sitting on the sofa in her robe. Miss Wanda tries to mind her mama because Miss Fanny is her mama, but she forgets and brings her a piece of sausage, butter toast with jelly, a scrambled egg, and a cup of herb tea. Oh my! That's way too much, Miss Fanny always says. But then she goes and eats it all up. Every morning after breakfast, Miss Fanny reads her Bible. She has worn out three Bibles, reading them over and over. Her favorite verse is, With God, all things are possible. Every Saturday, Miss Wanda washes Miss Fanny's hair. Miss Fanny takes off her robe and stands around in her slip, looking very tiny. Then she gets on a stool and sticks her head in the sink. Miss Wanda runs the warm water and puts the shampoo on her mama's head and scrubs until it lathers up. Then she scrubs some more. That feels good, says Miss Fanny. After she washes her mama's hair, Miss Wanda rolls it up in little tight curls all over her head. The curlers are real hard to sleep in, but Miss Fanny doesn't care one bit. She knows that when she goes to church the next day, she will look beautiful. On Sunday morning, Miss Fanny puts on a very pretty dress and high heel shoes. She puts on earrings and necklaces and lipstick and blusher and powder. Next, Miss Wanda combs out her mama's hair, which is all nice and soft and gray, like the feathers of a dove. Then finally, after all that fussing with her hair, she goes and hides it under a hat. Miss Fanny has three black hats two red hats, one green hat, two white hats, two navy hats, three beige hats, one brown hat, and the famous pink straw with roses. Because she never wears the same one twice in a row, some people think she has a whole closet full of hats, 
which of course she does. One Sunday, Miss Fanny's handsome young preacher came up to her and said, Miss Fanny, would you kindly give us one of your beautiful hats? It will go in the auction to fix up the church in time for Easter. That same day, Miss Wanda helped her mama get out her hats and put them on the bed and the dressing table. Then Miss Fanny closed her bedroom door. Lord, she said aloud, I'd appreciate it if you'd help me make the best choice. She always talked to the Lord as if he is right there. Miss Fanny walked around the room and looked at each one of her hats. The green velour with the fancy pen was very, very old and still very beautiful. During the terrible flood of 1916, she had crossed the swollen river on a ferry to visit her mother and father. As she stood at the rail, holding on to her beautiful hat, a house had floated by, almost close enough to touch. And over there was her wide-brimmed felt with a gleaming black feather. Ha! That feather had come from the tail of a hawk that was trying to kill her hens and biddies. She had grabbed the hawk around the neck and before, before you could say diddly squat, that hawk would never bother her chickens again. Then Miss Fanny picked up the hat made of soft brown velvet and stroked it. It had always reminded her of Flower, her grandmother's cow. Then Miss Fanny was just seven years old. She had started milking the brown, velvety, soft flower. Each evening she carried the milk to the spring in a bucket and set it in the icy water to keep cool. Later, her mama would pour the milk into a churn and Miss Fanny would churn it into butter just like you would buy in the store, except better. She realized that each one of her hats was like a friend, and each one brought back special memories. Finally, Miss Fanny came to her most favorite hat of all, the pink straw with silk roses. She had worn it every Easter for 35 years, and it always made her feel brand new like Easter itself. But she wasn't the only one who thought it was special. Everyone at church looked for her pink hat on Easter Sunday, just as they looked for the tulips and the daffodils to bloom in the spring. Miss Fanny took the straw hat out of its round box and put it on, even though she was wearing her oldest house dress with a torn pocket. She looked in the mirror and sighed. In her heart, she did not want to give her hat away. Not at all. She took a deep breath and repeated her favorite Bible verse. As she placed the hat in its round box, she said, You know, this hat really could raise a lot of money. As she put the lid on the box, she said, Maybe it could help fix our old pipe organ. As she tied the string around the lid, she said, Why, it could probably mend the crack in the church bell or put on a whole new roof. Suddenly, she discovered she was very, very excited. At the church auction, the handsome young preacher held up the pink hat with roses and looked around. What am I bid for Miss Fanny's famous hat? The bidding took off lickety split. At last, here was something more exciting to bid on than a set of kitchen canisters or an umbrella stand. Bang, went the gavel. Sold to the lady in the front row. The lady in the front row gave the preacher a check and seemed very, very pleased with herself. That's a lot of money, exclaimed Miss Wanda, who was impressed. Miss Fanny clapped her hands. It was enough to really get things fixed around here. 
She knew that she would not miss her favorite hat one bit, but she did wonder which hat she would wear on Easter morning. On Easter morning, Miss Fanny got up very early. She sat on the side of her bed and took the curlers out of her hair. Although she thought and thought, she didn't have the slightest idea which hat she would wear. Her red felt with the big feather was too hot. Her green velour with the fancy pin was too wintry. And there was no use to even think about the pink straw, which of course would have been just right. When it was time to leave for church, Miss Fanny looked so beautiful. She was wearing her best dress, which was a color of pale green apples. She was also wearing her best jewelry, her best gloves, and a white corsage. It's time to go, said Miss Fanny, picking up her cane and taking Miss Wanda's arm. Miss Wanda could not believe her eyes. Her mama was going out the door without wearing any hat at all. When they arrived at church, Miss Fanny couldn't believe her eyes. On either side of the freshly painted church, someone had planted beds of glorious pink roses. Pink roses were also planted along the walkway under the stained glass windows and in front of the old fence by the street. Oh, Mama, said Miss Wanda, it looks just like your pink hat. The handsome young preacher greeted them on the steps and gave each one a big hug. We hope you're pleased, Miss Fanny. We were able to patch the bell and fix the organ and your beautiful hat made it possible to buy all these roses. As Miss Fanny looked and laughed with delight, they didn't see an old woman at all. What they saw was a young girl with hair as soft as the feathers of a dove. Now when people pass the little white church, they think they're seeing a garden of dazzling pink roses. But what they're really seeing is Miss Fanny's hat, and it will always, always be her favorite. It's the end. Hope you enjoyed the story. Hi, my name's Kathy Bender, and um, I brought my friend with me, Emily. She likes to come with me when I read books. Um, the story I'm reading is Kiss Goodnight. The author is Amy Hest. It's illustration by Anita Jurem. It was a dark and stormy night on Plum Street. In the little white house, Mrs. Bear was putting Sam to bed. Ready now, Sam? Oh no, said Sam. I'm waiting. Mrs. Bear sat on the bed beside Sam and they read his favorite book and they both knew all the words. Afterward, Mrs. Bear pulled one side of the blanket way up high under Sam's chin and the blanket was red. She pulled the other side too, tucking it under his toes like a nest. Outside the wind blew. Ready now, Sam? Oh no, said Sam, I'm waiting. Mrs. Bear arranged Sam's friends in the bed, and they all snuggled close in the blanket that was red. Outside the rain came down, splat on the roof, splat, splat on the windows. The wind blew. Ready now, Sam? Oh no, said Sam, I'm waiting. Mrs. Bear poured milk in two glasses, and they both drank milk, and it was warm, sliding down. Afterwards, Mrs. Bear yawned, you must be ready now, she said, but Sam shook his head. I'm waiting, he said. Hmm, said Mrs. Bear, let me think. We read a book and made a, a, and made a nest, arranged your friends, and had warm milk. Sam, she said, what did I forget? 
You know, said Saint. Hmm, said Mrs. Bear. Book, blanket, friends, milk. Hmm, Sam waited. He waited and waited. And then at last, Mrs. Bear said, Oh, I know. Kiss goodnight, Sam. And she bent down, way down, kissing Sam once and twice and then twice more. Again, cried Sam. And she bent way down, kissing Sam once and twice and then twice more. Outside, the wind blew and the rain came down. In the little white house, Mrs. Bear was taking out the light, whispering, Kiss goodnight, Sam. Kiss goodnight. And Sam went to sleep on a dark and stormy night on Plum Street. The end. Hi, I'm Leanne McClung, and this is my daughter, Brooke. And today we're going to read How Many Veggies. Ready? Mm -hmm. Bob the tomato is taking a trip. A day on the sea will be fun. How many veggies are on his small ship? The answer, of course, is oh, one. Yeah. I know, honey. Here. <laughs> Just with reading, reintroduce myself. Okay, now don't say anything. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leanne McClung, and this is my daughter, Brooke, and today we're going to read How Many Veggies? Bob the tomato is taking a trip. A day on the sea will be fun. How many veggies are on his small ship? The answer, of course, is one. Still. Larry the cucumber joins Captain Bob. Could he find a place on the crew? Maybe first mate. He'd be great for the job. Now on the boat, there are two. Two little veggies are taking a trip. Junior says, what about me? I've got some crackers and soda to sip. Count them again. One, two, three. Uh, you turn the page. Larry says, hey, who will push us along? I'm not very good with an oar. Let's call Mr. Nezzer because he's so strong. Now on the boat, there are four. Junior says, Captain, our numbers are growing. Soon we'll be rowing. The wind will be blowing. But tell me, please, how will we know where we're going if no one is sitting up there? We need someone up in the air. The gourd they call Jerry is next to arrive. His compass and spyglass would help them survive. So quickly they vote him shipmate number five and send him up high in the air to stare at the sea from his chair. Five little veggies, no room for another, the perfect vocational mix. Till Jerry says, boy, I sure do miss my brother, and Jimmy becomes number six. Six is enough, Bob remarks to his men. At least it's not 10 or 11. But Percy jumps in, and when Bob counts again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Only one thing that we're missing, says Larry. A parrot. Now that would be great. Then Laura shows up with her pet parrot, Harry. And now on the boat, there are eight. Eight little veggies and one silly parrot, who came, you'll remember, with Laura the carrot. The wait, sir, says Junior. Our boat cannot bear it. We're headed for trouble, I think. Our boat is beginning to sink. Yes, eight little veggies all trying to bail, starting to argue and whine. I'm coming, yells Archie, and I've got a pail. He jumps in, making it nine. Okay, turn the page. Nine little veggies all wet to their knees, beginning to shiver and shake. Turn to see something come out of the trees that makes their hearts quiver and quake. Goliath the giant, a big bumpy pickle, runs down to the dock with a shout. I'm no good at sailing, but I just love bailing, so I'm going to help you guys out. Splash! Ten little veggies all taking a bath, as soggy as soggy can be. One little parrot looks back with a laugh and pilots his boat out to sea. What's that? The end. What's that, dude? Hat dog. He lost his hat, didn't he? They lost his hat. 
Hi, my name is Mary Roller, and I'm going to read a book to you today that was one of my children's favorites when they were little. It's called I Am a Kitten. It's by Ola Rimson, and it's illustrated by Jan Flug. I am a kitten. My name is Kate. I live in a pleasant house in the country. Every morning when I wake up, I have a nice, long, stretch. Then I wash myself and I eat my breakfast. I say meow. That means hello. I like you. I like to play with all kinds of things. I like to play hide-and-seek with my brother and sisters. When I first met Puppy, we were afraid of each other. But now, we're friends and we play together often. Sometimes I climb the big tree in our backyard. And sometimes I take a walk with my mother. And at night I wash myself and then I go to sleep. The end. I'm Nancy Fort and the book I will be reading today is Bark George by Jules Pfeiffer. George's mother said Bark, George. And George went, Meow. No, George, said George's mother. Cats go meow. Dogs go arf. Now bark, George. And George went, Quack, quack. No, George, said George's mother. Ducks go quack, quack. Dogs go off. Now bark, George. George went oink. No, no, George, said George's mother. Pigs go oink. Dogs go off. Now bark, George. George went moo. George's mother took George to the vet. I'll soon get to the bottom of this, said the vet. Please bark, George. And George went, meow. The vet reached deep down inside of George and pulled out a cat. Bark again, George. And George went, quack, quack. The vet reached deep down deep down inside of George and pulled out a duck. <clears throat> now bark again, George, said the vet. George went, oink. The vet reached deep, deep, deep down inside of George and pulled out a pig. Bark again, George, said the vet. George went, moo. The vet put on his longest latex glove. Then he reached deep, 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 deep down inside of George and pulled out a cow. Bark again, George. And George went, oof. George's mother was so thrilled that she kissed the vet and the cat and the duck and the pig and the cow. On the way home, she wanted to show George off to everyone on the street. So she said, bark, George. And George went, hello. The end. Hello, my name is Peggy Hollingsworth. By profession, 
I am a school librarian. The book I'm going to share with you today is one of a series that was introduced to me by a friend of mine, also a librarian here in Indiana. It's really called A Read Aloud Too Good to Miss. It's by D.B. Johnson and it is entitled Henry Hikes to Fitchburg. Henry David Thoreau was a real person who lived in Concord, Massachusetts more than 150 years ago. He loved to take long walks through the woods and fields and write about the plants and animals he saw there. In his pockets he carried a pencil and paper and many other things to help him observe nature. He could easily walk 30 miles in a day with a book under his arm for pressing plants and a walking stick that was notched for measuring things. This picture book is based on Henry David Thoreau's experiences of hiking to Fitchburg. One summer day, Henry and his friend decided to go to Fitchburg to see the country. I'll walk, said Henry. It's the fastest way to travel. I'll work, Henry's friend said, until I have the money to buy a ticket to ride the train to Fitchburg. We'll see who gets there first. His friend waved. Enjoy your walk, he said. Henry walked down the road to Fitchburg. Enjoy your work, he called back. Henry's friend filled the wood box in Mrs. Alcott's kitchen. Ten cents. Henry hopped from rock to rock across the Sudbury River. His friend swept out the post office. Five cents. Henry carved a walking stick. 25 miles to Fitchburg. Henry's friend pulled all the weeds in Mr. Hawthorne's garden. 15 cents. Henry put ferns and flowers in a book and pressed them. His friend painted the fence in front of the courthouse. 10 cents. Henry walked on stone walls. Henry's friend moved the bookcases in Mr. Emerson's study, 15 cents. Henry climbed a tree, 18 miles to Fitchburg. His friend carried water to the cows grazing on the grass in town, 5 cents. Henry made a raft and paddled up the Nashua River. Henry's friend cleaned out Mrs. Thoreau's chicken house, 10 cents. Henry crossed a swamp and found a bird's nest in the grass, 12 miles to Fitchburg. His friend carried flour from the mill to the village baker, 20 cents. Henry found a honey tree. Henry's friend ran to the train station to buy his ticket to Fitchburg, 90 cents. Henry jumped into a pond, 7 miles to Fitchburg. His friend sat on the train in a tangle of people. Henry ate his way through a blackberry patch. Henry's friend got off the train at Fitchburg Station just as the sun was setting. Henry took a shortcut, one mile to Fitchburg. His friend was sitting in the moonlight when Henry arrived. The train was faster, he said. Henry took a small pail from his pack. I know, he smiled. I stopped for blackberries. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to Thoreau and his way of thinking. My name is Samantha Joe, and I'm reading The Seals on the Bus. The seals on the bus go arp, arp, arp. Arp, 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 the seals on the bus go arp, 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 all around the town. The tiger on the bus go roar, 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 the tigers on the bus go roar, 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 all around the town. The geese on the bus go honk, 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 the geese on the bus go honk, 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 all around the town. The rabbits on the bus go up and down, up and down, 
up and down. The rabbits on the bus go up and down, all round the town. The monkeys on the bus go eat, 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 The monkeys on the bus go eat, 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 all round the town. The snakes on the bus go hiss, 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 hiss. The snakes on the bus go hiss, 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 all round the town. The sheep on the bus go ba 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 ba. The sheep on the bus go ba 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 all around the town. The skunks on the skunks on the bus go. The skunks on the bus go all around the town, and the people on. The bus go help, 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 help. The people on the bus go help, 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 all around town. The end.